slide presentation. And with that, I would love to introduce Susan Gilland. Susan. Thank you, Ron, and thanks everybody for your patience this evening. Um, Los Angeles Birders is really pleased to have John John as our presenter this evening. John doesn't really need an introduction. Most of you already know that he's a leading expert on the identification and distribution of North American birds and is very well known for his many works that I'm sure most of you have in your libraries. Some of his works include every edition of the National Geographic Society Field Guides to Birds of North America, now in its seventh edition, as well as the videos on the large and small gulls and hummingbirds. And John and his childhood friend, Kimball Garrett, co-authored The Birds of Southern California and the epic work, The Field Guides to Warblers. If you've been lucky enough to go birding with John, you'll know he's a gifted and patient teacher. John's been called a legend among birders, though that's a title that he laughs at and says, being overconfident is a sure pitfall. Well, if there were ever opportunities for pitfalls, shorebirds may be high on the list. John's goal is to teach birders to be careful with their identifications and know about the status and distribution of birds. So that's exactly what John will do for us in a special two-part webinar tonight and one week from tonight. John will discuss the genus Calidris, a genus of 24 species, all of which have been recorded from North America and all but three from California. These include the small peeps and stints. And so with that, let's welcome John. Hello folks, can you hear me adequately? Yes, we can, John. Okay, well, it's not important you see me. Uh, let me know if my voice fades. And uh, as you know, uh, maybe don't know, I'm more of a passerine person, uh, but I've always um, had a special love of shorebirds, which are my favorite family, actually. And actually, as I age, um, I don't hear the passerines as well. So as a result, you, you go to the, the things that are silent, the water birds. So I am having a a transitional conversion to things earlier in the field guide. But having said that, I thought we'd talk about a section of the shorebirds, a large and ever-growing section of the shorebirds, the calidris. So we'll look at that. And I want to thank Larry right from the start, Larry Sansoni. Nearly all of the photos are his. And all of us have worked on this. Susan, as you may or may not know, spends countless hours with Frank getting this program into something that would not be an embarrassment. Next image. So we talked about the 23 species within the family, the largest genus within the family, um, 19 of which all but four have occurred in California. All of them have occurred in North America can see the species that have not occurred, the great knot, broad-billed sandpiper, tumic stint, and spoon-billed sandpiper. And as for the great knot, well, 50% of one turned up, uh, the result of a illegal pairing of a surf bird and a great knot down in, it was seen down in San Diego. The pairing probably occurred in Western Alaska. Next image. The genus was described in 1804 and until the 1930s, or two years into the FDR administration, the genus was composed of only two species, the red knot and the great knot. The genus are, is quite variable uh, from our smallest sandpiper, the least sandpiper, to moderately good size species. And they utilized all sorts of foraging strategies, as you can imagine from a genus this large. And that's often uh, a key to identification, uh, keeping in mind, again, use all the tools in the toolbox to think about identification. Next image. Now, most, but not all of the species 
migrate south in their breeding plumage in July, into August, even some as early as late June. And the young birds migrate south in their juvenile plumage. Most of the species we'll discuss nest in the high Arctic. Um, some breed in Eurasia, northern Arctic Eurasia, some in Arctic North America, uh, some are whole Arctic bound in both. But think of them as northern species, some of them likely sandpiper also into the boreal zone. But most of the species are monotypic with no recognized subspecies or extra subspecies. Next image. When you're learning shorebirds, and this was a disadvantage when I started birding and using field guides, they showed you the breeding plumage and the or alternate plumage and the basic or the winter plumage. And uh, the young birds, the distinctive juvenile plumage wasn't shown. And basically in August, you saw all these birds that didn't match any illustration in the field guide. That's now been covered uh, quite nicely. And they, um, so the, the three plumages you need to learn are alternate, basic, and juvenile. Okay, next. And here's your topography of a typical uh, sandpiper um, showing all of the features. Most of the parts of the bird are pretty easy to sort out bill and eye and legs. Maybe we get into tibia and tarsus. But there's some complicated features that are essential to becoming a good shorebirder. And what I would like, a good place to always start are the primary tips. And those typically are dark and we'll, we have some images we'll look at. And they extend moderately to sometimes somewhat distantly uh, past what the next group of feathers is, which are the tertials. There's three tertials, or four, I'm sorry, and they, um, the middle one is the longest, and sometimes there's no primary projection, so folks call the tertials the primaries. The birds with the longest primary projection are the most highly migratory. So you find the primary tip projection, then you go to the tertials, and the next group up are the greater secondary coverts. One row. And then one row of median secondary coverts. And then multiple rows of lesser coverts, secondary coverts. And then right above that, you'll see a large group of feathers called the scapulars. The inner ones are smaller, and then they get progressively larger on the outer or lower scapulars. And they're quite a lot larger than the lesser coverts. Now, sometimes those scapulars are drooped over the wings, so you really don't see hardly any of the lesser coverts. So everything else is a lot easier to tell in terms of feather groups, but just start practicing on from primary tip projection up through the coverts. And once you have those down, life gets simpler. And then you need to tell what the scapulars are. Next image. So here's a real image. It's a juvenile semi-palmated sandpiper. You'll see the, uh, starting at the back of the bird, you'll see the primary tip projection, which, um, if Frank is there with the laser, oh, thank you, the red dot, follow the red dot. So about twice the width of the red dot is the, or the, is the primary tip projection. Notice the primaries are dark. And then when you get up to the tertials and the middle one is longer, there's a nice edge, pale or sometimes colored. And then when you would go up, you'd find one or two rather, greater secondary coverts. And then if you go in and up, you'll find scapulars, but all of the medians and the lesser secondary coverts are obscured by the small feathers from the underparts that come up and block them. 
that combined with the scapulars being drooped. Now we'll say later what's distinctive about a semi-palmated sandpiper, but um, concentrate now on just knowing when they talk about a key group of feathers, you need to know where to look. Next image. Now this is somewhat a long distance migrant, the buff-breasted that winters primarily in uh, Paraguay, Northern Argentina. And we'll remember we always start at the primary tip projection. Some species, the primaries extend past the tail, but there's again, there's noticeable primary tip projection. We have our tertials, the next group, middle one longer. Here we can see nicely the next group up, the graders, greater secondary coverts, one row, one row of medians, next group up. And then two rows, you see the bottom group of the lesser wing coverts and a second group. And then those blacker feathers, uh, more black centered feathers, those are all scapulars. And you can see how the inner ones are small and the, the mantle or the back feathers are a different pattern. So when you see photos, just practice uh, to, um, you know, what groups of feathers you're looking at. Next image. This is one of the, some of them are the most migratory birds in the world, the pectoral sandpiper. So starting at the wingtip, we have very long primary tip projection. That's um, indicative of a long distance migrant. They breed well west into Russia, uh, as well as North America and winter in Southern South America. So very long primary tip projection. And you have our three tertials visible and the greater secondary coverts, one row, one row of medians, lots of rows of lessers. And here are the scapulars are all tucked up. When you look at feathers patterns also, see here, if we look at those inner scapulars, they're, the whole bird is kind of striped above because the dark goes off the tip of the feather. But if we go back one to the buff breasted, I think that's, can we back up? See here, the fringe goes all the way around the edge of the feather, including the tip. And it gives us a very scaly look. We'll see that again in Baird's difference between a striped looking bird and a scaly looking bird. Pectoral and buff breast are a larger colidris. Next image. Here's another long distance migrant, the Bairds. Uh, here the wings are so long, they go extend beyond the tail. Very long primary tip projection. Gives the bird a kind of a horizontal stance to the ground. I want you to see how scaly they are. Again, sort of like buff breast rather than striped. Let's find our tertials and the greater secondary cover. It's the next row up, one row of medians and then a couple of visible rows of lessers, and then those scapulars are distended. The lesser covered feathers are small, the lower scapulars are large. That's one way to tell the difference in those feather groups. Next image. Now a species like Western Sandpiper, uh, it has pretty short primary tip projection about the width of the red dot there before you hit the tertials. This is a nice comparative shot. These are basic plumage. Everybody struggles, oh, I need to see the leg color. Endless whining and sniveling that you can't see the color of the legs without looking at the color of the birds. The westerns are in basic plumage are gray and white and the leaves are brown. It's, you can see that almost at any distance. So I tell folks to forget the color of the legs. Next image. So 
So we'll start with the images. I'm um, the technical advisors here. Am I coming through all right? Yes. Yeah, yes, you are. But visually not visible, correct? That's correct. So we're going to start with Great Knot, a bird that breeds in Northeast Asia and winters in Australasia. Uh, if you go to, um, well, Australia or Thailand in the winter, many, lots of big flocks winter. Uh, it breeds into Northeast Asia, not surprisingly, gets into Alaska on an almost annual basis, mainly in the spring. It's um, the best place for it is the Seward Peninsula, which is that part that bulges out towards Chukotka. Now that's named after um, William Seward, who was Lincoln's Secretary of State and who engineered the purchase of Alaska from Russia in 1867. For, it was called Seward's Folly. Uh, Seward was nearly done in, in the Lincoln plot, but very insightful of them. And they've named a peninsula after Seward, who was from New York. The uh, outside of Alaska, uh, Great Knot has occurred uh, once as a juvenile in uh, coastal Oregon, and the other time, uh, believe it or not, in West Virginia. And then there was a record of a half of a Great Knot, the hybrid with the surf bird, turned up two different years in San Diego in breeding plumage. Next image. So here's a Great Knot from um, St. Lawrence Island. At Gamble, uh, the Eskimo village there. And it's very distinctively patterned, a lot of rufous in the scapulars, a lot of blackish across the breast with arrow shaped spots, has a longer bill than a red knot, and is larger than a great knot. Not surprising given its name, the great knot. Described by Horsefield from Java. Now to look at the similarity here between uh, Great Knot and a breeding plumage surf bird, how similar they look. Obviously the bill shape is totally different, the leg color. And they occupy somewhat similar breeding habitats on ridge tops. The surf birds in Alaska and the Yukon and the, the Great Knots in Northeastern Russia, Russian Far East. They prefer different habitats uh, during the winter season. Now here's the, um, the surf knot. And this bird, you know, it was really struggled over. Is it a great knot? And if not, it, but it didn't look quite right. And it was looked at endlessly. People worried quite justifiably. It looked a little small. Um, and the uh, wing pattern was really, and, and tail pattern was really quite intermediate between a, a surf bird and a great knot. And those who know the species well, particularly the great knot, uh, Pavel uh, Tomkovich, a Russian uh, shorebird biologist, uh, endorsed this. He said, that's exactly what it is. It's pretty amazing. So there should be a paper in Western birds uh, but however, we've been waiting now for um, eight years, so uh, don't hold your breath. Long overdue. The red knot uh, is smaller and it's whole arctic. Uh, there's, it's a polytypic species with five subspecies that are, it's a complicated picture. Um, we have several in North America, which I haven't fully understood all of the differentiating characters. Next uh, image. Here you can see the breeding in the winter grounds. 
So some winter away in the south, southern South America, Australasia, few in Southeast Asia, some winter up into Europe and North America too. But mostly coastal. And in California, the best place are the large coastal bays, especially San Diego Bay. It's a much rarer migrant inland, uh, most regular at the Salton Sea, where it's regular in spring. Here's one that's described by Linnaeus, or Lynn, uh, 1758 from Sweden. Next image. Here's one from the Great Lakes. They appear in late May where they're rather rare, but regular. It's a beautiful bird, perhaps slightly suggestive of a dowager, but more compact overall, feeds differently and the bill is shorter. And it goes to whitish in the undertail and vent. Next image. There's Larry's shot of a worn summer adult, but still in breeding plumage on a sandy beach. Somewhat dowager like, but again, uh, the bill is much too short. Next image. Now here's a juvenile red knot. And uh, the juvenile and basic birds are much more, well, maybe obscure. Uh, and most folks look at them and wonder what they are. Now we're dealing with a pretty good sized calidris, a good sized shorebird. So it's gonna be much larger than the peeps with a, a bill of moderate length, but not terribly long, pretty straight. And one thing about the juvenile red knot that's very distinctive, if you look at all of those feathers above, you'll see a dark subterminal fringe. So there's a pale fringe with a subterminal bar on the inside. And that's characteristic of red knot and, and diagnostic. And only one other species shows that pattern. Um, and we see fewer of those. That's the much smaller Temex stint. Next image. So the English and particularly the scientific name Canutus honors King Canute the Great, one of the latter Viking rulers who ruled um, Denmark, Norway, and the UK. And his heirs ruled until 1066 when King Harold uh, ran into the Normans, Norman the Conqueror, at the Battle of Hastings, considered perhaps the key date or event in European history. King Canute himself is rumored to have assembled his flock and disappointed them by telling them that he couldn't control the tides. The accuracy of that, I'm not here to say. It was before my birth. Next image. So here's the surf bird. It and the sanderling have the greatest latitudinal winter range. You can see from some to Southeast Alaska, all the way to Southern South America. Whole Arctic species, we're just showing the North American range. I, I'm sorry, I can, that's a, a mistake on my part. It's a North American species. I was already thinking of Sanderling, a, a brain moment. Um, it uh, down ma mainly coastally on rocky areas, often with black turnstones, jetties. It'll join um, occasionally, you'll find a rock sandpiper with them. In the spring, their habitat choices broaden to sandy beaches. Uh, I was always taught they fed on grunion eggs in the spring. Accidental inland and elsewhere in North America, uh, except at the Salton Sea where it's probably annual, casual in spring, accidental in fall. 
So let's look at the next. Here's a typical surf bird, rather chunky with a short, short fattish bill with a colored base. Arrow shaped spots underneath, dis distinctive in that sense. A fair amount of color in the scapulars. Next image. Now here's one in the fall on a sandy beach. So notice the colored base to the lower mandible. Short uh, greenish legs. Next image. Spring birds at Goleta Point. Southern Santa Barbara County. Uh, you might get one in the winter, but they're best known as a spring migrant, such as the flock here. And Goleta Point is a great place. In winter plumage, slaty gray, greenish legs, always a colored base to the bill, the mandible, lower mandible, kind of stubby build. Next image. They're larger than black turnstones. And well, they're not as black, which shouldn't be surprising. This one I think is a little paler. I still think it might have some uh, juvenile plumage left in it around the head, even though it's January. Next. Surf birds are very easy to tell in flight with that white best base tail and a broad, dark tail band. The wing stripe, the wing stripe isn't as bold or the wing pattern is a turnstone. And it'll be larger than a turnstone, larger and paler. Next image. So the ruff is one of those species that's now in Calidris that formerly wasn't. It's an old world species. The majority went winter in Africa, south of the Sahara, but some also into Asia. It's very regular in North America, particularly in the Eastern US, uh, but also on the West Coast, much rarer while inland. And it's of annual occurrence in California. There's one breeding record for Northwest Alaska, but probably is bred elsewhere. Notice the huge old world breeding range. Next image. So the male rough and full breeding plumage, the, the roughs are acquired late and shed early. They're colored differently. Uh, some are rufous, some are black, some are white. And they established leks where they perform displays and strut around. And the females sneak in from the side and mate with these males, but sometimes meet up at the edge of the lek with males that are dressed up as females, which are duller. And those transvestite males get to have, uh, get to mate with those females before the females ever get to the main lek. And the British, with intensive studies of ruffs where they breed commonly, discovered this. There aren't many of these obscure or low key males, but uh, it's well established that this goes on. Next image. This is more of a rough and, this is a rough and basic plumage. Notice all those pale internal marks on the tertials and the coverts, almost bars. They have a funny posture, a funny shape, kind of a smallish head, bigger body, a shortish bill for the size. It doesn't show it here, but often those mantle feathers stick up in the air. Light colors varies from greenish to quite orangey red. Next image. They kind of have a slow floppy fight, very white underwings. Next. Here's one in full basic. 
Next. These are probably females at the, um, in Ventura County, birds that wintered. Next. They're very, always very scaly. Basic plumage, that funny shape. Next. Now the juvenile plumage is pretty interesting and easily is confused. Uh, one, they're very scaly. Uh, and you might confuse it with a buff-breasted or a sharp-tailed sandpiper. Uh, not, feather shapes are a little different. It's kind of a post-ocular line, uh, but the face and the underparts are very buffy. Full juvenile plumage here. Next. Here's another juvenile. It would certainly stand out if you're looking at regular shorebirds and you find this. They like wet grassy areas, but winter in a variety of different habitats and migrants are seen in a variety of habitats. Next image. Now ruffs, as I mentioned, have a slow floppy flight, show very white under wing coverts and have this distinctive horseshoe shaped white band on the upper tail coverts. It wraps around the dark centered feathers on the rump. Contrast with the darker tail. Another shot of a juvenile ruff. Um, John, before we leave ruffs, we did have a question. Is there any known reason why rough reproduction developed to become so complex? Uh, I'm sure there's a reason, and I could think of postulating, but nothing comes to mind. So I think I'll just say, I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you. But, uh, you know, buff breasts sort of form mini lecks too and have displays. And to be honest, uh, we just don't get to see, you know, when we see these shorebirds, we see them feeding and we don't go to the breeding grounds. Of course, there's a million mosquitoes, but studying the breeding shorebird biology is a fascinating exercise by itself. You see shorebirds perched up in conifers and calling excitedly and very elaborate display flights and display songs that you never hear. So it's, uh, it's a whole art by itself, studying the shorebirds where they breed. And leave it to the Brits to look for transvestites within the lek. So the sharp-tailed sandpiper, it breeds on the Arctic coast, mainly of the Russian Far East, from the River Lena and east of the Kalima Delta and Chuan Bay. Winter is mainly Australasia. Now, the fall migration, and this has been well studied, is fascinating. Fascinating. The adults migrate basically straight south overland, so over the interior of the Russian Far East. But the juveniles flee to the coast of the Bering Sea and then follow the coastline south. And they do so with, in great numbers, and many of those get to Western Alaska, and some of those down the West Coast, where we see them in September, October. Uh, we don't see enough of them. They're always exciting to find. Uh, once in a while, one turns up inland, and then there's a scattering of uh, winter season records and spring records of colorful breeding birds. We used to think it was closely related to the pectoral sandpiper, which its size and shape and plumage suggests, but it's not related. The, the genetic uh, information indicates it's very distantly related to pectoral. Certainly the call notes are very different. So here's a breeding adult. Think pectoral, but the markings underneath are different, uh, typically with a much more rufous cap, uh, more streaked, more arrow, more scallop shaped marks underneath, with a very bold supercilium and a white eye ring. 
very bright, colorful, beautiful bird. Now here's an unusual adult that turned up at, near the San Joaquin Marsh in early October with remnants of breeding plumage here with uh, long-billed dowagers. And this is the plumage we typically see. So has like pectoral has pretty long primary tip projection. It's a long distance migrant. Look how broad the rufus is on the edges of the tertials. All of this gives a very bright plumage above with a bright buffy breast, a very bold supercilium that broadens behind the eye and a rusty cap that shows the fairly distinct eye ring again. Now the key from pectoral, you'll see a band of streaks across the upper neck just below the white chin. But below that is unmarked buff, just a buffy breast with no streaking. Pectorals, when they get a nice buffy breast, wherever there's buffy, there's streaks. And that's probably the best field mark. If it sounds like a pectoral when it flies, it is a pectoral, no matter how you uh, interpreted the field marks. Next image. Shows the rufous cap, supercilium, the strip band of streaks across the upper neck with unmarked buff below that. Next image. Still another juvenile sharp tailed. I think they're one of the most beautiful shorebird sites you encounter. Of course, for us, they're rare, so they're always exciting to see. Look how long the primary projection is. We're going to go from the Arctic coast to the Russian Far East to Australia, New Zealand. You're going to want pretty long wings. Uh, the broad-billed sandpiper, another one that was formerly in its own monotypic genus, Limnicola, genetically shown to be within Calidris, somewhat of a patchy breeding distribution from Phenoscandia to the Russian Far East, although not to Chukoka. It's casual in fall, all juveniles on the, mainly the Western Aleutians, but oh, I think there's a Pribilovs record. And then there's two records for the East Coast, one of which was a juvenile, perhaps could involve two subspecies. Uh, next image. So broad build has very long bill that droops, uh, short legs, and has somewhat like a, a snipe head pattern with a split supercilium. If you look at the top of the head, you'll see a whitish streak that splits off from the supercilium. Or another, put another way, that supercilium just in front of the eye splits with a sub supercilium that goes up along the sides of the crown, sort of like a snipe. They give a scratchy note. If you want to see them, uh, go to Thailand where you can see 40 plus species of other shorebirds. Broad builds are quite common. Stelt sandpiper. Another one formerly in its own genus, Micropalama till 1982. Uh, this one's most common as a migrant on the plains. They do breed west to uh, Northern Alaska, some. Big numbers on the plains, fewer to the East Coast, many fewer to the West Coast, but they're pretty regular at the south end of the Salton Sea in the Imperial Valley. They winter way south, but some winter in North America too. Next image. So the breeding uh, stilt sandpiper, very barred with a chestnut cheek, uh, has very long legs and a fairly long, for a bill, 
almost like a dowager, but it has a slight droop to it. Notice in all plumages has a very distinctive supercilium. So that's the breeding plumage. Next slide. Here's a, also a breeding plumage bird, not quite as far along. You'll see the longish bill, the slight droop, the yellowish legs, the very long yellowish legs, the chestnut cheek, and the distinctive supercilium. Now, even though it might, you might think of a yellow legs looking at it, they don't feed like yellow legs, dipping their bill into the uh, the water. Uh, the the still sandpiper, the yellow legs dip their bill and pick. Still sandpipers often feed like dowagers and often associate with dowagers and probe in the mud. And they're smaller and grayer than um, dowagers. Here's the juvenile plumage. They typically arrive, the few that do get here, about the 20th of August. I saw with Larry a number in uh, Northeast New Mexico on this last Friday, and they were all molting juveniles, molting to, to basic, but still all with juvenile wing coverts which is somewhat different of stilt sandpipers. You often see them already molting out the mantle feathers to first basic. So this one's full juvenile. Next image. Notice the distinct supercilium. These are tricky. You know, you might think of, oh, what am I looking at? Are these yellow legs? Are these lesser yellow legs? But look how the bill droops. That right-hand one's already molting some mantle feathers to first basic somewhat mottled, streaked underneath, the long legs. Next image. And here you can see the malt underway. These are both young birds already malting uh, the mantle and scapular feathers. When they fly, notice the white uh, rump and tail. They could be easily confused with Wilson's phalarope in flight, but look the long, Wilson's phalaropes have very short legs. Stilt sandpipers have very long legs, which is of course why stilt sandpipers walk around in shallow water happily and uh, Wilson's phalaropes are either swimming or walking on the shore where they more or less move in a waddle. And stilt sandpiper bills are, of course, even longer than needle-like and uh, uh, even longer than stilt sandpiper. The genetic relative of the stilt sandpiper is the curlew sandpiper, the old world equivalent. Breeds in Arctic Russia, uh, east of Timer, almost to Alaska. There is a breeding record for Barrow. Winters Africa, south of the Sahara, few to uh, Europe, Southern Europe. It's casual um, to North America at all times of the year, but mostly in migration. Uh, there was a long staying bird up on the uh, beach at UCSB, Galita Beach. May still be there. Next image, in fact, you're gonna see Larry's pictures of it. Now, these, this shot here, think of uh, curlew and stilt. Remember, they're each other's relatives. Curlews have a thinner bill with a more decided droop near the tip. This is the juveniles we're comparing. Cleaner underneath the juvenile curlew, more modeled in the stilt. The supercilium's more distinctive on the stilt sandpiper. Next image. And that shows that this is the breeding plumage uh, curlew sandpiper with, with a Western. And you can see the bill very thin and then the distinct D curvature gets very ruddy colored uh, and colorful above in the, in the breeding plumage. Very white underwings. Now here you can see the tail, the tail is dark, 
unlike stilt sandpiper. Of course, you're never going to call a bird with reddish underparts a stilt sandpiper, but in juvenile and uh, basic plumage, it's trickier. Next image. This is the juvenile that's been on the beach here in Santa Barbara. You can see the white rump, which is a good field mark, and dark tail. Next image. Uh, this certain juvenile certainly has a good supercilium. Fairly good primary tip projection. Uh, richly buff across the breast. Bell-shaped difference from the stilt. It has shorter legs than the stilt sandpiper. And the legs are dark. And here's one in winter plumage from Thailand, uh, which is um, where big numbers winter. Now here, in this plumage, the confusion species is Dunlin. And some Dunlins do winter in Thailand, as well as, of course, in many in Western Europe, different subspecies than what we have. The bill's a little finer than the Dunlin. Um, the color, especially from our Dunlin's a little paler, a little cleaner underneath. Um, the best way to be sure though, is to see the rump and tail pattern. Next image. So that's a curly sandpiper showing the white rump and upper tail. Wing stripe isn't terribly evident. And there's a Dunlin with the dark stripes extending through the tail and a bolder wing stripe. So if you're certain you had a curly sandpiper, but it flies and it had a big dark center down the tail, it's a time to panic and attempt to get yourself out of the hole. Don't say you're on a different bird and keep digging the hole deeper. So here's Tem Extent. The hardest thing about Tem Extent is learning to spell it. Type uh, specimen taken in Germany. Uh, we'll look at some images, but this is a bird that breeds all across from Phenoscandia all the way to Chukotka and uh, Northeast Russian Far East. Looks like a lot like a small Baird's, but has no real primary tip projection. And this is the one, and we'll look at an image, I think where the, the juvenile plumage is very red knot like with those dark subterminal fringes. Temex is a really distinctive beast. When they fly, they give a rapid watch-like rattle call. It's totally unlike any other call I've heard from a calidris. You can see where they winter, Africa south of the Sahara, up the Nile, the Indian subcontinent, Southeast Asia, Indonesia. Next slide. Now this one's in basic plumage. Some have compared it to our the old world equivalent of spotted sandpiper common sandpiper, but of course, it's a small peep. A distinctive about it that's smooth and gray with no real patterning at least. Um, it's a regular spring migrant in Alaska, uh, St. Lawrence Island mainly, the Pribilofs, but it's very rare, I mean, but still annual, many fewer in the fall. There are two, fall records from the Pacific Northwest. One, one a juvenile, maybe the other one was too, British Columbia and Washington. Kind of a horizontal stance to the ground. The typical breeding bird, legs are kind of greenish, and it'll have a scattering of alternate type scapular feathers with a bit of rufous in the feather in black. Somewhat like bears with this scattered random effect of darker spotting. Next image, very short legs. And here's the juvenile. Notice the um, subterminal dark fringes on all those feathers above, particularly the visible scapulars. And that's totally diagnostic. So if you have a 
bird you might think in late August or September might be a TEM extent, it better have those because it's going to be a juvenile. Remember, the juveniles move through later. And uh, that's really a distinctive pattern. Long toed stint. Now, we call them seven deadly stints, and we're starting on them. They used to all be close together, but they're not genetically close. And I have put these species in the right linear sequence based on the 2012 paper. Look at the scattered breeding areas that are known for long-toed stint. Siberia and the Russian Far East. Winter mainly in Southeast Asia, few to Australia. It's rare to uncommon in the central and western Aleutians. In spring, many fewer in fall. Uh, probably regular, a few up to the Pribilofs. And every few years, one turns up uh, on St. Lawrence Island. There are two fall records for the West Coast, both of juveniles, one from Oregon, one from Monterey, California, around the 1st of September. So let us look at a long-toed stint. Here's Larry's shot from mid-February in Thailand. Now there's, this is a little subtle. The basic comparison species is leaf sandpiper, which it looks a lot like. In fact, it wasn't until Lars Johnson figured out the face pattern that we really knew what to look for on a long-toed stamp. Everybody said, well, I had long toes. Well, leaf sandpipers have long toes. But if you look at the face pattern, you'll see the supercilium is pretty distinct behind the eye and extends forward and then gets pinched off by the dark forehead, which curls around and forms a J in the lowers. So a J lying on its side. And then if you look really hard, and maybe not on this bird, it'll show a little bit of color on the base of the lower mandible. The bill is very slightly straighter than a least. Legs tend to average a little yellower. Like least, there's no primary tip projection. The call note of long-toed stent is lower pitched than least, more like Baird's. Next image. Uh, this was thought, to, there are two records in the United Kingdom. Um, this was thought to be the first up in uh, County Durham, Northeast England, near where Captain Cook was born. Uh, it turned out that Phil Round got the first record in Cornwall back in 1970. I believe it was a breeding bird. But look again, all plumages. See how the supercilium is pinched off. It's very bold, but it's cut off from the dark forehead. That is absolutely diagnostic. That's brighter above than a Lee Sandpiper, somewhat differently patterned. If you look at the median coverts, they're fringed, edged in white. The legs are a little yellower than least. Frank, are you there to bring the laser light? Ooh, right now. There you go, you nailed it. There are the median coverts. Remember below are the graders, and the tertials have nice rusty edges on them. But the median coverts are important. The mantle V, there's a white line on the side of the mantle, tends to be better formed on long toed stand as opposed to least. Now, on this one, you'll look and you'll notice the paler base to the lower mandible. Next image. So here's the one. It stayed for a few days uh, in Monterey. Uh, Salinas, actually, Monterey County. It's found by Brian Daniels, who um, Brian identified it very quickly. And I was living in Santa Barbara and he called, he was so excited. And just because I have hardly ever heard Brian sound like that, I was already grabbing the Binox to drive to Salinas. And of course he'd gotten it right. And that remains still the only California record. You can see the supercilium's pinched off right up there. 
that diagnostic head pattern. Next image. So I compared the English long-toed stent, which by the way, had almost the exact same date span, uh, the, the one from Durham, as did the Salinas bird, both juveniles. And there's a leaf sandpiper, a juvenile underneath. The supercilium extends across the forehead on the least in juvenile plumage. But in long toe, that's diagnostic in all plumages. Well, what can we say about spoon-billed sandpiper? It's got a distinctive bill shape. We had always figured that out. Breeds in the Russian Far East on the coast, winters in Southeast Asia, the Red River Delta, the Gulf of Thailand, a few, Myanmar, Bangladesh, a few in extreme Southeast India, about 10 uh, records for Alaska, none of them recent, and a very well famous bird, Barry Sapi found it uh, the end of July to early August, 1978, Iona in uh, Southwest British Columbia. Um, they, let's go back if you can go just quickly. Back one. So there are about 400 left. Uh, there's it, It's a hands-on approach to try to save this species from extinction and involves threats and migration from the draining of the marshes by the Chinese and the Yellow Sea, which they there's been a major turnaround in them doing that to talking to tribes, well, not really tribes, but uh, the folks, the fishermen, the people that live on the coast of Myanmar who put out nets and catch shorebirds. They had a, a name for spoon-billed sandpiper. They was a major education effort not to eat those birds. And then even so, in the Russian Far East, there were problems with dogs and disturbance. So, when they lay their first set of eggs, they take them to incubators and stimulate the adults to double clutch. And it's an all hands effort involving cooperation between the Russians and others, and mainly the British, to try to save the species from extinction. And we certainly do want to save it. it used to be in its own genus, because of its bill, it's now with Calidris. Um, Linnaeus described it from Suriname as the type location Suriname on the north coast of South America, which obviously was an error, was Eastern Asia. Next image. They look a lot like a redneck stent, but with a longer bill, and of course, the spoon, which can be hard to see. Next image. These involve breeding plumage birds. A uh, couple of the last ones to be seen in North America, 1986. And Ed Greaves found them. He was photographing redneck stents and looking through his viewfinder when he almost had a heart attack and died and realized they were redneck stents. Uh, sorry, realized they were spoon-billed sandpipers. And everybody got to see them. They stayed a few days as a pair. So here's the lookalike species, the redneck stint. Breeds northern Siberia, the Russian Far East, and a few probably every year in Western Alaska. Wintering uh, the Indian subcontinent, Southeast Asia. It's pretty much rare, but annual in Western Alaska, casual elsewhere in North America, mainly in the fall. Next image. And they do indeed, do indeed have a nice rufous neck. Um, the breeding, you can look at that bill and it's fine tipped, not a spoon-billed sandpiper. There's some other subtle differences in breeding plumage, uh, but you'd have to look carefully. I know that the first few years to Hong Kong, I didn't see a spoon-billed sandpiper and we we're all pretty desperate. And one year, the one was found that looked good, 
but there was an immediate red flag. It was in breeding plumage and the spoon-billed sandpiper is seen in Hong Kong in spring or in basic plumage. So we all hoped for an exception to the rule. But a guy who knew the bird well said, no, I don't think it is. We thought he was a spoiled sport. Turned out that the it was a redneck stint. They had a tumor out one side at the tip of the bill, almost in the shape of a spoon. And as soon as it revealed itself, that's what it was. We knew we were doomed that year. Next image. It's a beautiful shot of a breeding redneck stint. This is one that was in a fall migrant, an adult in July. The other problem, we'll back up quickly if you can. Uh, the other problem is breeding sanderling. If we back up one image there. If, uh, if you'll notice, there's a nice rufous throat and below that are streaks across the white breast um, against a white area. And sanderling, there's color and spots intermixed. Next image. Juvenile redneck stint. Uh, telling that from semi-palmated sandpiper is very tricky. As a result, I know of only uh, perhaps two that have been found in the lower 48 in fall. Uh, it's a little bit more of a slender, attenuated appearance at the back end, a more horizontal posture. The tertials and the coverts are a little paler centered than semi-palmated. The inner scapulars are a little more colored, but sorting one out from a semi-palmated would be a major uh, difficult thing to do. Next image. The winter plumage, very semi-palmated like, a little paler in the face perhaps. Uh, it's a plumage we don't see semi-palmated in. And for that matter, we don't, I don't think uh, there's a record of a redneck stint in this plumage in North America, but a you know, pretty stubby bill. So here's the look-alike problem with redneck stint and sanderling. You can see the dark markings throughout the color on the sanderling and internal markings. Obviously, if your redneck stint is on the beach and running around and following the waves and it joins 20 others that look, that look the same, they're probably not redneck stints. Redneck stints have a hind toe, sanderlings do not. Sanderlings are larger, of course, with a much bolder white wing stripe. Um, and we don't see sanderlings in breeding plumage till May. You see them also when they return in that plumage in July. Next image. going back to a juvenile redneck stint. They're really quite plain, or not, not terribly bright above, except for the inner scapulars. The bill's a little finer tipped on average than semi-palmated, but it's very difficult. Next. Showing some of the rufous coloration. Slight mantle bees, whitish mantle bees. Not as bold though as a little stint. So the big problem is uh, the big problem is telling Rufus next stint now from uh, little stint, which are very similar, redneck and little stints and juvenile plumage. Next image. And here's Sanderling, which has the, the huge winter range, which we discussed. And the whole Arctic uh, nature of the breeding range. Two weakly differentiated subspecies. This is the one you see on the beaches following the waves, said to be declining. It's a fairly rare bird inland. It's a late migrant in the spring, mainly May, mainly late May. And uh, in fall, Adults by the end of July, juveniles typically not till the end of August. And rare inland except at Salton Sea. Uh, we see at Owens Lake, normally see it annually in May and then again uh, 
July, early August for adults and juveniles by the end of August and through much of September. Some have wintered at the Salton Sea, but the, otherwise it's strictly coastal. Running on the beach. The first one in uh, Redneck Stent in the United King Kingdom at Fair Isle, which was being celebrated and many twitched it. And the British Bear Bird Committee, British Birds Records Committee accepted it, but they decided to send it to the shorebird expert extraordinaire, Lars Johnson, who suggested, have you thought about sanderling? And it turned out Britain's first redneck stent was in fact just a sanderling. They've had more, thankfully. Next. Juvenile plumage is really striking. So we see them in August, late August, September. You see these birds that sort of look salt and pepper like above. The, those um, scapular patterns, there's a black strip that divides the white spots, which gives it more of a spotted look. Very white underneath with a necklace. Fairly for its size, a pretty short bill. Here's juvenile sanderlings that are molting. So some first basic scapulars. Now sanderlings do have a dark a blackish shoulder, which um, can be very visible on the folded wing, although can be obscured as well. They're strikingly pale underneath, even paler than a Western sandpiper. And if you're into these things, the, if you look carefully, they do lack a hind toe. Maybe that makes it easier for them to really run on the beaches. Quite pale headed. And a very bold, this is a juvenile bird in flight. All plumage is a very bold white wing stripe, bolder than any of the seven deadly stints. And it's also larger. And some sanderlings in flight. Next. And John, actually, John, if I can interrupt one second also, um, since we're on Sandra, <coughs> excuse me, since we're on Sanderlings, uh, Lance asks, the Sanderling range map shows them breeding in a large region of interior western Greenland. Most of that area is still covered with glaciers. Was that an error in the map or? Hmm. What a fascinating question. Thank you, Lance. Um, Paul told me that 10 of our National Geographic maps, well, that's kind of weird. I mean, it looks like the, it's a splotch of color. What happened to Baffin Island? Maybe it's a splotch of color that just spilled out into the... <laughs> something's wrong. Thanks for catching the error. We're redoing the complete book of birds. I hope Paul, Paul noted about a dozen errors he had in Greenland that were pointed out, but having them breed in the ocean is a problem, not to mention close. <laughs> I mean, there's sanderlings are specialized, but they're not specialized to drown. Good catch. I'll get it, look into it. All right. So that's the first part. Um, we had some technical issues earlier, so I don't, I hope everything came through okay. Uh, you're um, blissfully, you didn't have to look at me, just listen, which hopefully wasn't too bad. But I'm more than happy to answer any of the questions to the best of my ability. In some ways, we, we maybe we'll, um, you know, we would compare little and redneck stinks and things, things we thought were sister species but they're not related. Like toad stand and leaf sandpiper. Yeah, we do have a couple of questions popping up. Uh, the first one says that you said that longer distance migrants tend to have longer primary tip projections. Is that simply coinc coincidental or is there an actual relationship? There is a relationship, some sort of something called evolution that 
covering that great distance, these birds uh, having very long wings is obviously helpful to, to, for a trans-equatorial migration. So you look at all of those bairds, white rumped, buff breast, um, pectoral, Hudsonian godwit, American golden plover, uh, all of them have very long uh, primary tip projection, very long wings. Oh, okay. And um, can you tell us what Lars Johnson is doing these days? You know, I can't. He lives in Sweden with his family. I haven't seen any publications from him. He wrote, if you've looked at it, his illustrations in Peter Grant's uh, identification of the of the stints, those seven species, is one of the best identification articles ever written. And his paintings are just extraordinary. Um, we have a picture of him, I believe, in part two. He joined us at, uh, on Alaska trip in 1984. Uh, he wanted to go up and what did he want? He wanted to go up and sketch gerfalcons on a cliff. So we left him and drove 50 miles and came back and there was no sign of Lars. And I started <laughs> working, even though he, he's six foot six, that maybe one of those big bears had carried him off. And I had to end up climbing up the cliff around the side and found him, he was sound asleep in the tundra. <laughs> but that's not where he ended up. Uh, he lives on an island off the coast of Sweden, I assume, still. Uh, is it Gotland? Uh, he wrote a, a beautiful book of the birds on his island. And Chris has his own European field guide. Mm -hmm. And are there any other questions? I don't see anything popping up in the Q&A or on the chat. Well, I'll make a comment. As, we, as you learn these birds, uh, and <clears throat> learning shorebirds and my advice is to find a place that not doesn't necessarily have the most birds but a smaller number of birds that you can get close to and work the entire flock there may be fewer species than some other place but get comfortable with them and keep working them and especially the juveniles are can be incredibly tame I want but once I've had a few almost walk between my legs. And sometimes I just take, if the bottom is firm, which is no guarantee, you can just sort of stroll out and they become your friends almost. And you just sit and relax and keep learning, you know, how to tell. Everyone's excited to see a stint, but they haven't a clue how to tell a least in a Western really. Learn the common species absolutely cold. And the more you learn those, the more an unusual species will stand out. Wow. If you, if you think you have a rarity, these birds have their little feeding territories. Now a peregrine may come through and uh, it's wonderful the peregrine coming back, but if you're a shorebird fiend, peregrines aren't your friend. They can click out. But typically they'll keep coming back to the feeding territory. If you think you had a rarity and the flock gets up, and they sort of come back and you don't find your rarity, that's the first warning sign that maybe you messed it up and it's time you rethink or back off until you find it again. And really all photos, all rare shorebirds should be supported by photographs to be evaluated. Absolutely. Uh, we do have, uh, Lance has another question. Is there any way for birders to help with spoonbill sandpipers, uh, such as to an organization that accepts donations for conservation? I bet if you Google, um, I'll, I'll try to research that and have an answer <laughs> if you're not totally discouraged or fed up with me uh, next week, I'll contact Phil Round. I, we probably find something online, but I have no doubts that the folks in the UK doing the captive breeding would greatly appreciate donations and would be, there would be an online donation. And uh, 400, I, I Googled that, I'm not certain of that number. It was thought to be as few as 250, but they found a few more breeding. It's great to see cooperation uh, in these days of increasing isolation between the international authorities and a global effort to save a 
and it would be inc just incredibly sad. One of uh, the things about this year. Right. Kurt Leisner just um, put into the comments, oh, uh, it just disappeared on me, that the British trust for ornithology is no doubt accepting donations. So British trust of ornithology are uh, for ornithology. It's in the it's in the chat. That's and the BTO. That's a very well established ornithological organization in the UK. Oh, great! And Mary Freeman asks, "What is the closest relative of the sharp-tailed sandpiper?" Well, I had it in the right linear sequence. Did it come after rough? We'd have to go back and look. Or I grab it. <laughs> Let me look at the California checklist. I think I have the latest taxonomy. Kimball would know this in a heartbeat. Um, so, no, I don't have the latest. Hmm. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, here's 2020. So the linear sequence, sharp-tailed is between rough and stilt sandpiper. Now, none of that I would have intuitively guessed. I mean, vaguely, it looks like a juvenile rough. I see nothing about it that suggests stilt sandpiper. Nope. You know, our shorebirds, um, the Eskimo curlew is certainly extinct, the last one collected on Barbados in 63. I think slender-billed curlew is gone, last one in 95. So the curlews seem to have been hammered the most, but spoon-billed is the next most vulnerable. Uh, Nordman's green shank is very vulnerable. There was a lapwing type of plover uh, found in Java that went extinct uh, over 100 years ago. Uh, so shorebirds in general are quite vulnerable. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, John Lobel, if you can type that uh, email address into the chat, I cannot share it from the Q and A. Uh, John Lobel found a um, a, um, a website that handles spoonbills uh, sandpiper conservation, and we, as you know, John, we're sharing this with uh, live. Uh, excuse me to YouTube to, uh, via live stream and a question coming from YouTube is how useful are images of wings open in images of birds particularly in regards to primary length are flight pho photographs useful that's a difficult I'm, question I'm sorry about that but it is but uh, you know normally it's hard to assess on a flying bird what the primary tip primary length a bird a, a very long wing species in flight it often tends to fly a little slower uh, and the wing tends to be a little thinner and more attenuated um, but how it expresses itself at rest is something a lot easier to quantify than an impression in flight so it's a very valid question but that's not something i've spent a lot of time trying to do i do see a real shape and difference in flight say between a Hudsonian Godwit that winters in uh, all of in big numbers down to Tierra del Fuego and marbles, which winters in big numbers on the coast of California. Hmm, interesting. Uh, also from YouTube, how is relation determined? Percentage of overall genetic code similarity or number of highlights, uh, highlights similar genetic sequences, do you know? I, um, I would get into trouble if I started saying anything about the genetic codes and how they how they branch the trees and based on uh, what information there's bootstrap support that shows and puts them on the same or adjacent branches and the bootstrap support gives confidence. But really, me opining into this area is I um, I'm told quicksand is fake except when someone starts opining on something they know little about. <laughs> and uh, is the little curlew a calidrus? No, it's, uh, 
it's a one of well the curlews are in their own genus oh okay you're obviously um well, very you, similar well i don't know um i suppose they've genetically compared them uh you would um any claim of an eskimo curlew of course would have to be differentiated from little curlew so even if it occurred on the texas coast in spring right where eskimo curlews occurred it would still be more likely a little curlew because eskimo curlew is extinct <laughs> once they can't come back yeah mary freeman asks you if you know the status of the little curlew oh it's um uncommon to maybe fairly common in asia they winter they winter in australia they're seen as a migrant in hong kong sometimes elsewhere in southeast asia they breed in uh i'd have to look i believe it's uh eastern siberia the russian far east um i not to chukoka although two of the records in alaska are both from saint lawrence island uh, eskimo curlew uh, it, it might have bred over into the Russian Far East because their records, you know, from the Bering Sea from 150 years ago uh, and elsewhere in Alaska. The only known Eskimo curlews bred in the Mackenzie, uh, on uh, Mackenzie, I'd have to look, but it's mm -hmm. not, not, near, not near the Arctic Ocean, but... Uh, mm -hmm. Um, I'm wondering okay. if is there a way, Ron, to, that if folks have additional questions in the week, they can funnel them to you. They may folks think of additional things to ask, and we could a hold them until next week. Am absolutely. Um, if you uh, would like to ask any questions regarding tonight's uh, webinar, you can go to our website at laburgers.org. And we have a contact us uh, button on there. Just um, go ahead and click the contact us and put it in. And we'll forward that question to John. So we'll either get, depending on the question, either get back to you right away or save it for next week. And speaking of next week, John, uh, John will be back. John Dunn will be back next week, next Tuesday at seven o'clock for part two of uh seven deadly stints uh, so this, yeah, so clarify ron it's um they're four in the old world they're the small calidris so four in the old world three in the new world the three in the new world are least sandpiper semi-palmated sandpiper western sandpiper the old world tem extent long toed stint little stint redneck stint and the people have sometimes say well it looked like a stint it's just because the Brits use the word stints, we referred to them as peeps. I, I don't know if that went into a, was to, in Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence that we would call them peeps. We're not calling them stints, or King George decreed them that they were stints, but they're, they're basically the same thing. It, we, we just were divided, uh, despite the common language, we're divided by a difference of opinion. <laughs> We're divided by a common language. Okay. It sounds fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Sean. Uh, all of us. Uh, thank you. Whoops. Uh, let me come up. So I apologize for the the audio. I, I wasn't late. I was there. <laughs> Um, I, I, I want to apologize to everyone for the video. Uh, the video just for some reason wasn't working on Zoom, but hopefully we'll have it worked out for next week and you'll be able to see John. Uh, again, thank you very much for everyone joining us and everyone over on YouTube. And thank you, John, and we will see you next week. Sounds good. Thanks, all. Thanks for putting up with me. <laughs> good night. Thanks a lot, John. It's great. You bet. Thank you, John. See you, folks. I know you had a stressful evening. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Thank you. See you next week. Good night. Good night.